Good morning. Yep, good. Good morning, everyone, in case you don't know me. My name is Ben Stern, and I teach in the science department here at FBL. We're going to start today by singing our hymn, hymn number 583. In case you're not familiar with this phenomenon, it seems to have started around 2008, and it basically involves person A sending an email to an unsus unsuspecting person, person B, with a disguised link that one click links to the song Never Gonna Give You Up by Rick Astley. For example, if I send an email to somebody saying, hey, I just got this video of Mr. Nolte telling us there's a snow day tomorrow, they'd click it, and instead of snow day joy, they'd get Rick Astley in that song instead, which is arguably better. I went back into the school records, and of all the faculty members, Mrs. Gilmet has been rickrolled the most times. <laughs> Mrs. Gilmet, yeah. Uh, Mr. Shereen and I still laugh about it each time, particularly that time that we built a very detailed fake spreadsheet of guidance stuff, and we stopped by your office to go over it with you. Good times. Remember that, Mrs. Gilmet? Yeah, okay, she does. Good. <laughs> if you'd like more information about rickrolling, let me know. I'll send you an email to a link. <laughs> to the story. So you might be wondering, why in the world would I rickroll you at chapel? Why would I tell you we were going to do one thing and then totally and unexpectedly switch to something different? Actually, there is a point, and the point is, it's sort of what Jesus did in our reading. Today's Bible verses are from John 6, 24 to 35, but before we get into them, let's look at the context surrounding our reading. At the beginning of John 6, in verses 1 to 15, Jesus had gone over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, and crowds of people had followed him. It was getting late, and there was no food for the people, so Jesus did one of his iconic miracles, the feeding of the 5,000. As a reminder, he used a boy's five barley loaves and two fish to feed the entire crowd of people. Of course, this has no natural explanation, and it was a supernatural display of Jesus' godly power. Naturally, this would be absolutely stunning to the people, and you can be sure they were starting to think of all the good things on earth that Jesus could do for them with that kind of power. When that evening came, Jesus and his disciples left the people, and they sailed back across the Sea of Galilee. And the next day, the people who were at the previous day's miracle, plus probably quite a few more after hearing about what happened, found Jesus on the other side of the sea, which is where our verses pick up. We read from John 6, 25 to 36. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, Always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. Based on this interaction, I think we could describe what Jesus did as a sort of divine rickroll. Feeding 5,000 people had the people expecting one thing, namely food. And when they came to him again, he had something entirely different for them. In this case, not a great, catchy song, but rather spiritual blessings. 
Now, Jesus didn't do it to deceive the people or make a joke. Rather, he was doing this to make a point. I want to focus on three things here. First, how Jesus utilized the collective history of the Jews. Second, to build the contrast between earthly and spiritual needs in order to emphasize the most urgent and necessary need of the people. And finally, how the people reacted. First, we have to go back into the Old Testament when God fed the Israelites with manna from heaven. Exodus 16, 13 to 15 says about the Israelites, That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew about the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. At the time of this story, the Israelites, God's chosen people, were wandering in the wilderness, hungry and desperate for sustenance. God, in his mercy, provided them with manna from heaven. Jesus knew that this story was extremely well known among the Israelites and among the people. It was the history of the people, after all. And some of the people were probably starting to think that Jesus had given hungry people bread. Maybe Jesus was kind of like a new Moses, who was going to lead the people out from under the Romans into a new earthly kingdom. And the thought of all the earthly blessings he could give them was quite exciting. Now that the people were excited about these possibilities, you can imagine they would be interested in following Jesus to see what other good stuff he had in store for them. However, as I read above, the feeding of the 5,000, after this, Jesus and his disciples took off in a boat to the other side of the Sea of Galilee without telling the people. You can almost hear the disappointment in their voices after they find him on the other side of the sea the next day and say in verse 25, Rabbi, when did you get here? Besides, it was probably time for breakfast or lunch, so they might have been hoping he'd hook them up again. This brings us to our second point, the contrast that Jesus is drawing. In verses 25 to 34, Jesus goes in a totally new direction from their expectations. He emphasizes that he is not on earth to be some kind of baker king, but rather he's here to provide for the spiritual needs of the people. He says, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. The people don't seem to quite get it yet, saying in verse 34, Sir, always give us this bread? In response, Jesus gives one of his most iconic statements and crushes the hopes of those who thought he would be only the source of future baked goods. We read from John 35, and then later in John 6, 48 to 51, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here's the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Whoa. In sharp contrast to the Israelites and Moses, Jesus told the people his main purpose isn't to provide for their physical needs, but rather their spiritual needs. In the way the Bible does so many times, it comes back to a former theme. In the manna story, the Israelites were wandering in the desert, hungry, desperate for sustenance, when God stepped in and gave them manna from heaven to feed their physical bodies. Almost 1,500 years later, the Israelites and the entire world, for that matter, were wandering spiritually, hungry and desperate for spiritual food and drink when God sent Jesus, the bread of life. And that was his true purpose, to rescue the people from their spiritual starvation. While he did feed their physical needs through this miracle, it was to serve as a sign that he is, in fact, God. Even his language alluded to that. In the story of Moses and the burning bush in Exodus, Moses asked God, suppose I go to the Israelites and ask them, who has sent me? The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Jesus echoes that when he says, I am the bread of life. Jesus has made it clear in several ways he is the true God here to save the people from their spiritual hunger. Which brings us to our final point. How did the people respond? Quite simply, when the people saw that Jesus wasn't just going to perform miracles for them, a bunch of them got mad and left. John 6, verse 66 says, From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. They couldn't get past the idea that Jesus wasn't mainly there for their physical benefit. But what about us? What do we see Jesus as? Do we lose sight of the fact that we're put here on earth to glorify God and to serve him and others, and to bring others to faith in Jesus? Do we find ourselves only chasing after earthly success, achievements, and desires for earthly gratification? Do we only go to Jesus in prayer when we need help with these earthly things, and we see him like some kind of magic genie to help get us every desire? These things are like the food that spoils that Jesus talks about. We might feel satiated and full after eating them, but it won't be long before we're hungry again. 
We'll be looking for the next achievement, the most next exciting thing, the next success to help us feel full, even though in the end, these things won't give us lasting fullness, and before long, we'll be hungry for the next thing, always chasing and never feeling satisfied. And if we don't get what we're asking for, do we get mad at Jesus for not giving us what we think we deserve? Do we think that just because he didn't give us what we wanted, he might not be worth following, and we, like many in the crowd, wander away from him? The devil is always happy to whisper into your ear that because Jesus didn't give you exactly what you asked for, he clearly doesn't love you, and it's probably a good idea to just walk away. If you ever find yourself thinking these ways, Jesus gently reminds us that in Luke 19.10, in our verses today, why he came to earth as a baby at Christmas, he says, The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, as well as, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus came to earth to repair the brokenness between God and man that was caused by our sin, through his death and resurrection on the cross, and through faith in him and his sacrifice to give us eternal life in heaven. Does this mean we shouldn't pray to him about anything and everything, even if it seems trivial? Absolutely not. Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And God does, and will continue to, shower us with earthly blessings beyond belief. But that doesn't mean he'll give us everything we ask for, or even that he'll make our lives comfortable. And in an unexpected twist, he's also telling the crowd, and us too, that even if we ever did accomplish everything we wanted on earth, we'd still have a hunger in our souls, because the one thing needful is the bread of life, Jesus and his word, the spiritual food that never spoils or fades. Through faith in Jesus, our spiritual hunger and needs are satiated. So, in this new year, filled with challenges and new blessings, let us remember that Jesus never promised us physical comfort or the satisfying of all of our earthly hungers and desires. But he did promise to provide for all of our spiritual needs, and he gives us a profound peace and fullness that nothing on earth can provide. In closing, and for our prayer, let's turn our hearts and minds to a hymn that praises Jesus, for real this time, a real hymn, our bread of life, for both his earthly and his spiritual blessings. We're going to sing hymn number 600. I'll praise to him. I'll play the song through once really quickly, go into the setting, and then we'll start singing.
Good morning, everyone. A couple of announcements before we get to the ones that will be up on the screen. First of all, yesterday, and judging by the 300 plus responses we already received,